hello everyone and welcome to this session with Julie DeRoche. She's going to be speaking with you about embouchure, air shape, articulation, giving you some tips on how to use these techniques to uh, easily and comfortably express yourself. So I'm going to let her um, do all the talking, get out of the way, but I do want to encourage you to ask questions. We'll save some time for that uh, at the end. So thank you so much and welcome Julie. Thank you, Jessica. So, well, so on screen with me is Suki Jang, who's um, a student, a former student at DePaul, just graduated, and is going to be a little bit of an assistant for us today if we need it. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't see all your faces. I was hoping to work with you and see your faces, but apparently that's not going to happen today. So I'm just going to pretend like I'm looking at all of you out there. Um, so the the truth is i actually thought that this was going to be an hour-long session and it ends up it's only 30 minutes and i have a great deal of information that i would like to give to you this is going to be it is being recorded so you can refer to it again later if you're interested and um so i'm gonna i'm actually going to talk a little bit more and have a little bit less of the um the participatory part that i was going to have you doing on mute um, but you're welcome to take your clarinets and try these things as we go. I might pause so you can try some of the things. And um, the, the other thing is I recommend you take notes on your device or on, you know, pad of paper if you want, so that you can kind of keep track as we go. Um, what I'm going to talk about is basically easy ways to position the clarinet in your mouth, embouchure formation, what happens on the outside with your muscles, tongue position, so what happens on the inside, and then um, if we have time, maybe a little bit of information on articulation. So we'll <laughs> see, I just saw Bob Springs note. Um, and Bob, thanks for being here. I wanna say that if this is completely different than what you might hear from one of your teachers, of course, always refer to your teacher first. And also that it's, it's a bit hard to talk in general about things like this because I'm not looking at every single, I'm not looking at any of you actually, um, your, your mouth, your shape of your mouth, your shape of your face, et cetera, et cetera. So these are ways to think of it in a kind of general way and then to go practice with and then let yourself sort of develop a personal approach to these ideas that you work on yourself or you work in, on with your teacher. Um, so starting with positioning. Um, one thing I've thought about through my teaching time is the advice we get a lot of times that says, don't bite. We don't want to bite. Problem students have with that is they often can't figure out how to hold on to the clarinet. We have to hold on to the clarinet in order to get it to work. So the combination of the question of how do you hold on the clarinet without biting becomes kind of a, a dilemma for a lot of people. And the, this has to do with how you place the clarinet in your mouth. I think the best approach for this has to do with putting it in a, in a way that works for you angle-wise, where the main pressure of the embouchure is at the top of the mouthpiece, meaning your hands press the clarinet upward toward the top teeth to some extent even almost to the point where it feels a little bit like it's going this direction, but not actually pushing your head up, just leaning the clarinet to the top teeth, rather than having it sit on the bottom half of the embouchure. And this allows the reed to vibrate. I'm going to talk about muscles in just a minute, but what you then do is open your mouth, probably about, I don't know, the width of your finger, centimeter, half inch, quarter inch. Top teeth go against the top of the mouthpiece and the jaw then, and when I say jaw, I'm talking about the bone itself, your jaw bone, not your chin muscle. Your jaw moves toward the reed so that the reed is held in a forward direction rather than an upward direction. So your teeth are basically, if my finger is the top teeth and my thumb is the bottom teeth, you're, instead of just opening your mouth, which allows your jaw to pinch upward like you're biting a sandwich, you're actually opening and moving a very small amount forward in your leverage. 
So the leverage, instead of squeezing the mouthpiece this way, becomes actually this way. Or if I were to use my thumb and bend my thumb, it would be thumb to the top teeth, moving my jaw so that my teeth are moving toward parallel. The amount you go forward is easy to figure out. And it may, depending on your mouth, it may not be like your top and bottom teeth are parallel, but it'll be moving that direction. If you use any high note, for example, a high D as a way to figure it out, where your angle is and how forward your jaw should go. Basically, if you get undertone, you're not going far enough. And we've all experienced the time we've been playing Schubert Unfinished or something and get undertone in the high notes, as, as the, especially as the air diminishes. Your jaw forward will solve that. So you move your jaw till you get the D to speak. You can do it on any note, but D happens to be a good note. If you go too far, it's going to, first of all, feel tense and uncomfortable here, which you don't want. You want this to be done in a sort of a relaxed manner. But if you go too far, you're going to start getting into the upper partials and getting high notes that you don't want or squeaks, what we call squeaks. So positioning is the start of your embouchure. Actually setting all of this up before you even get into talking about muscles is really important. I think of holding the clarinet with both hands. In other words, I squeeze the clarinet in both my hands and I, I press to the top teeth, move my jaw this way. And not too far out, not too straight, because that leads to biting. Not too close, because that becomes restrictive with the reed and makes you sound slightly pinched. And you can move the angle this way and that way to figure that out. <clears throat> now, technically, I was hoping I'd see you all and let you try this right now. So if you want to take a minute to try it out there somewhere, you can do that. This thing about the jaw forward, by the way, is great for teachers because I'm sure you've all had situations where your young students go and they can't get those high notes even at A, B, and C. And if you teach them what I'm going to talk about next with the embouchure muscles and this jaw position, those notes come out right away and are really, really much easier. And then you're not telling them not to bite because going forward actually opens the bite a little, whereas going upward is biting. Upward is biting, forward is opening up the bite in a good sense. Um, if anybody has any questions about that as we go, keep them in mind, because I'm gonna try to save a few minutes at the end. I think we'll, we might be able to have a few minutes at the end to have some questions. Now, all of that is very much connected with what goes on in embouchure. I would say the question is in the chat, should there be a slight underbite? Possibly, depending on your teeth, or your teeth could be parallel. Probably, well, actually, probably more parallel than an underbite. You don't want to go too far with it. Hope that answers the question. And we can talk about that more later. So you're going to open your mouth and move toward parallel, probably not past the front teeth, probably just toward parallel. Unless, of course, your mouth is designed in a way that if you go a little further, it sounds better. So, you know, ultimately our ears answer this question. Um, I might say in a little side that all of this that I'm talking about, positioning and then embouchure and then tongue position, articulation, is so that we can find a way to be as consistent as possible with our tone and our pitch and not have to move around too much to get different sounds in different places or to alter our pitch. Because there's a lot of different tones out there, and there should be. I don't think there should be one tone. I think everybody has to have an individual sound. This is developed through time and with your ear. But what we all do have to have is consistency of tone through the registers and good pitch. And we can't be too acrobatic or we're going to start changing the quality of the tone and the quality of the pitch. And of course, this is also when you're doing kind of traditional classical kind of clarinet playing. So this is like square one of how to get good sound and good pitch. Um, 
So the exterior then is what goes on with your embouchure. And your embouchure, the important thing to know is that your embouchure doesn't go around your mouthpiece. Put my cap on. Your embouchure, I mean, yes, it does, but I don't think of my embouchure as being built around my mouthpiece. I think of embouchure as being built around the structure of my face. And my face is my cheekbones, my gums, my teeth, my jawbone. So I'm, by doing everything we just talked about, I'm setting up the structure. And from a, and around that, you know, the structure is like the beams and girders of a building. It holds up the walls. So if you're using your structure well, and then you think of having your embouchure muscles go against your face later around the mouthpiece, but mostly against your face, 90% of your embouchure can be set up before the clarinet's even near your face. And this makes it easier to hold on to because instead of going forward to the mouthpiece and trying to hold embouchure, you're actually just gluing it to your bones. So what I think of as, as the setup is this position we just got to and around that goes these steps of the embouchure. And I always talk them through in this order and I do think they work as a package, but that doesn't mean you can't work on them one step at a time. Of course, your lip, I do single, I do single embouchure, by the way. So this is, doesn't, if, if you use double embouchure, you can use a lot of these concepts though, but this is uh, obviously a single embouchure. So the lip goes in, of course, you know that. I mean, the roll the bottom lip in, do it with the muscles, not with your finger. And make sure if you have students, they don't do it with their finger because that just puts the lip in without using the musculature. We obviously need to use the musculature. The lip goes in to the front edge of the bottom uh, teeth, sort of at the angle your clarinet goes on, is around where your lip changes color from the pink part of your lip to your skin. And this is a kind of Marcellus thing. I got a lot of these things from my teachers, of course. He called this the pressure point, which is what I call it. So you want to put the reed where the color change is because that's a stronger place on your embouchure. It's not so wiggly because there's not muscle in the lip, but you're not going so far in that you're getting a rub on your skin. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to see much evidence that you're, you're actually playing clarinet, maybe a little bit. Um, so you're going to roll your bottom lip in. The next step is the chin muscle pulls down. Now, backtracking to what the jaw go, does. If the lip is going in and the jaw is going forward, you'll help your stretch of your chin that we all want to get that nice flat chin. Corners go in toward the sides of the mouthpiece, but stay tight against the face. So against your canine teeth or your pointy teeth here. And the top lip stretches under the nose, presses down on the mouthpiece, does all the work that double lip does, but it just is on the mouthpiece instead of under the teeth. Lip in, jaw forward, chin down. Corners in, top lip working or stretched under the nose, tight against the top teeth. I always tell my students it's like, taking super glue and gluing it on, you know, putting it on your gums and teeth and it all gets stuck. It doesn't look very good to play clarinet when you do it well, but we got to do it because that's the way we get a good sound. We look kind of weird and pointy. Now, there's an important thing I'd like you to try, and that is, I'm sure if you're a teacher out there, especially of young students, you've seen, you've seen students, you tell them to get their chin down, but they go like this. That is because, Suki, you probably have seen that. I saw your face. <laughs> that is because their jaw isn't helping the situation. Their jaw is actually withdrawing when their chin is going down. So number one, you got that's why I always start with that little piece of information. The second thing is, if you stretch your top lip under the nose and your jaw is going forward, your chin muscle goes down automatically. So if you would try to put your jaw forward, stretch your top lip, and don't even think about your chin, 
you will find that you can't not have your chin down. It goes down automatically. Now that's as long as the jaw is going forward to help the stretch. So if you're going like this, it won't work. But if you go like this with the jaw, this will be nice and flat. And that I have experimented with this with young kids and that totally works. If you get them thinking of the embouchure as much from here as from here. And so it all becomes a package, like I said. So to review that, lip going in, pressure point is at the place at the front edge of the bottom teeth, roughly. Chin goes down while the jaw stretches forward, corners in, top lip stretched under the nose. And if you'd like to try that for maybe a minute or two, maybe I'll just be quiet for a minute. Um. There is a question, if you want to, uh, sure. would you like to answer right now? Um, there's a question saying, please consider a few comments on double lip embouchure. I, I'll comment on that, and I'm not opposed to it. I think this is a very personal choice. I think the great thing about it is it makes you use this top lip muscle, and a lot of people just let it sit up there doing nothing. So it helps you to learn to use that. I personally prefer single because of my idea that if you put the pressure toward the top teeth and then you hold on until you get resonance and control, but no more, you can get a lot of projection and vibration. And that's what we need when we perform a lot of projection and vibration. So it's a, I, I feel like for me, um, and I've heard great players with double lip who get lots of projection and vibration. So this is a personal thing. But for me, I get my best sound if I think of more of the pressure of the embouchure at the top of the um, teeth. And you can't do that so much if you've got double lip because the lip is there. So that's why I do that. The way I figure out how much to do is, you know, just play a low C and don't even use my right hand to get the leverage up there. And, and then, of course, take a little bit of it back when you put your bottom hand on so that it's not quite that much. And you'll see your sound will be like more, um, more vibrating and open in the positive sense, not open in the sense that we don't like, which is a kind of spready sound. Anything else? Did that make sense? From our yes. Yes. Um, so we've got the, we've got the position now. And we've got the, the outside. So now we have to figure out what to do with the inside. And um, we all hear all the time that we should have a high tongue position, which I agree with. And yet we're told to, sometimes we're told to open our throat and blow, which is also a, a thing that doesn't work. Those two don't work together. Because usually when we open our throat, we're we're forcing the tongue down in an ah position, which of course makes the back of the tongue open and not high. What we want to do with our throat is really just basically let it do what it, what it wants to do when you're blowing, which it'll expand just a little. You don't want to restrict it, but you don't want to think of overly opening it because that is a pushing down of the tongue. And what we want to do with the tongue is we want to leave it high and when it's high, it's simply relaxed. So when your tongue is in its most relaxed position, like when it when you're listening to me talk, it's actually sitting, if you think about it, rather high in your mouth in the back. You probably can feel the sides of your upper molars, especially if your teeth are closed, but even if you open them a little, you know, it's floating up in the back just so that it, it's not being pushed down and there's plenty of room for air to go through. The, t the tip of the tongue is probably floating around behind the top teeth right where we want it when we play. So if we don't push the tongue down and if we leave it relaxed, we're going to have it in this nice, easy, high tongue position that's natural to your body. I think of saying shh, like an SH sound, maybe with an E attached to the end. So if you've got your setup, then you've got the exterior of the embouchure round and focusing everything. And then you're leaving the tongue relaxed and you just go 
which is a little bit of an open for in, and then a relax out. And you do this from the low range up to the altissimo register where you do have to change a little. You basically can stay in that tongue position and get beautiful, even sound for your whole entire scale. And the advantage of this is it makes articulation easy, which I'll talk about just in the most simple form in a minute. But it also allows you to use your air in any way you want. So if you're doing or what you can do then is change your airspeed to not only change dynamic, but to give a beautiful shape to even the shortest note or to your note endings or whatever. So this is the way I don't have a handout. Maybe I'll make one and send it. Um, so this is the way you can make easy, beautiful music. You know, if, um, if we're a kind of clarinet player that doesn't use vibrato, which many of us are, we often sound boring. How do we get over that? Well, we have to make sure our note shapes are absolutely beautiful, subtle, not always apparent to the listener, but making something vocal and human happen. So they can't be utterly stiff and shapeless just because we don't use vibrato. And this is the way you can do that. Now, I have like nine minutes. I want to give a few minutes for questions. So the thing I want to attach to this then is how do we articulate? in normal single articulation for now. There are many people who are much greater experts at double tonguing and all multiphonics, all that contemporary techniques, which I believe we all have to learn. But for now, this is just basic single tonguing. So if we're in a sh or she tongue position, and we keep our tongue in that position, but we need to have a slight consonant sound in order to start articulating. I mean, we don't speak in only vowels, therefore we can't play in only vowels. We have to have some kind of consonant sound at the beginning of our articulation. I think of it as a real light T. Some people like D. Either way, the articulation you have to think of as light and do what works best for you. But I'm going to use T for this presentation for the moment. I think the, um, the part of the tongue that you should use is the tip of the top of the tongue. So our tongue is not, our tongue is very mobile and it's thick and we wanna keep it not moving too much. So we wanna use only the tip of the tongue and instead of the edge, more just beyond the edge. If you were to place that on the roof of your mouth as a demo and say, Shh, and then put the T on. While the tongue is still up until basically up to here, you're just moving the tip. That's how you can get light tonguing, keep tonal shape when you're articulating, and eventually get fast. So that you can articulate single tongue as quickly as possible. Now, obviously, when you are actually playing, you're not going to, to articulate off the roof of your mouth but you're gonna take that same tone con or articulation concept and you're gonna to touch just under the tip of the reed. I don't know if I pointed that right because I couldn't see very well, but just under the tip of the reed. Now you may feel the edge, just never feel the mouthpiece. If you go too far down, then you're gonna to have to do it harder because the reed is thicker. So you wanna do it up toward the tip where the reed is very thin so that you barely have to touch it. And instead, instead of doing that off the roof of your mouth, you're going to put the clarinet in. The tongue will be poised to work right there. And you're merely going to touch it in your T and then let go of it. And your tongue acts like a valve. Your air is right up there waiting. And that's... That's all you have to do for tonguing. And you know, if you can if you can go to that and practice it all, sort of sequencing this whole thing, tonguing becomes much, much 
easier. You'll get a beautiful sound, whether you're slurring or tonguing. You won't be moving too much of the tongue, which causes pitch and tone to change. So we want to keep the tongue consistent. And you can eventually develop light speed. And the only thing I'll add to this before I ask for questions is the air then. I think of the abdominal muscles as your support. I think of the lungs as your supply. And I think of this tongue position and embouchure, everything I just talked about as your shape. And then you can do whatever you want. So you're going to breathe in. Don't have time to get into that discussion, but you're going to breathe in. Then your lungs all the way up to the tip of the reed become like a funnel getting increasingly more focused. Lungs, windpipe, tongue creates a tunnel. Air is waiting right by the reed. And when you let go, you get sound. When you touch it, you get silence. That's all there is to it. So, um, I just, sorry, I just got distracted by something. So anyway, that's, that's basically, if you can, if you can master position, outer muscles, inner shape, articulation, all of it becomes a easy package. It takes a while to learn, but it becomes an easy package. You'll then be able to get away from all those technical things look at your music, decide what you want to do with it, and easily accomplish it, musically speaking, with consistent tone and consistent um, pitch. So, so that's my presentation. We have, um, I was just trying to see how much time we have. We just have a few minutes. <laughs> we can go it's slightly late. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Um, there is one question. I know you didn't get to uh, breathing. Um but there is a question saying, how do you open your mouth to breathe while playing? Oh, this is a good question. So a lot of people do what I call, uh, no offense, but I call it, I feel like it's guppy breathing with the moving the bottom of the embouchure. This is a, a no, no, because every time you put the clarinet back, you put it in a different place. So what I do if I'm playing is I just lift my top lip and then I put it back. And inside, I'm going a little down, like ah, e, t, or t, 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 t. That's how you make sound. Hope that answers the question. Any others? Uh, not currently. Please feel free to put your question in the chat or in the QA Q and A box. If you have any questions, I'll see this. I'll see if I can just make a kind of outline. Although this is complicated to talk about, <clears throat> so um, I kind of resisted doing that in my own mind. But if it'd be super helpful, I can try to do that and send it to the ICA. Well, I know that you've you've done a lot of work on this topic as well. So if you have resources yeah, there are... that are already in existence, don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Just send something you've already done. That's also okay. Yeah, there there are um, old LeBlanc articles and Yamaha articles about embouchure articulation. They're kind of written for LeBlanc Bell, so it's a little bit of different language, but they're all out there floating around. So yes, the video will everybody. be posted um, probably in about forty five minutes after I've rendered it and uploaded it. And if you have questions, feel free to write me at my DePaul address, which is just jderoche at DePaul, D-E-P-A-U-L dot E-D-U. Um, there is one question, if you, if you have time. Um, sure. Do you have ways to think about articulating fast and light? It's just using that concept that I was just talking about with the T. And it's basically keeping the work only in the front of the tongue. And think of it as a lever that goes like this. When if you're moving less tongue, you can move it faster, and it doesn't get so so tense. Okay. And another question is saying, as someone who has had some pretty rough TMJ flare-ups, can you talk about how subtle the jaw movement is? I would be concerned if people push their jaw too far forward. Yes, and that's a good good point and a good question. But the way to get rid of that problem is not to tense up in the jaw hinge, which is often because you've got the jaw inside your mouth and you're, you're trying to resist biting. 
So that's one thing. If but to answer the question about how far to go, I would say don't go too far past parallel, maybe not even that far and hear it in your sound and do it by relaxing the jaw hinge forward rather than tensing it up. It doesn't mean you're not going to use your jaw muscles, but there's not a lot of tension when I do that. I just use my jaw to help my chin stretch and use your judgment about that. If it's causing too much tension, you're going too far. And actually, it may help your TMJ. I've had a lot of students where that has actually helped their TMJ because it's resolved the dilemma of how do I hold the tone without biting? That's the important part of it.